Okay, good morning, everyone. So for those of you who are in person, welcome uh, to our uh, ship, uh, sustainability and ship design conference. Uh, for those of you who are continuing with us online, uh, again, welcome. Thank you for continuing to join us. Uh, our next presenter is Gilhelm Gayard. He is the manager of the ship's department at Marin. Thank you uh, very much, Bradley. I suppose you hear me still? Yeah, yes, we do. You're all good. Okay, good. Then I will start. Well, thank you very much uh, again, uh, Bradley, and thank you to the old staff at the web to uh, to host the, uh, the the second edition of the uh, of the conference we created last year. Uh, well, I would like also to thank a lot, uh, Laurent and Laurent, to let's say to bring all your enthusiasm in, in creating this event and and allowing it to uh, to go ahead. So. Um, happy to see that many um, uh, are online or on site. Unfortunately, I could I could not make also this year to, to come to you, but I uh, I can almost promise. I hope that when we do a third edition next year, I I will join to also help uh, at the Web Institute to prepare and to realize the uh, the old uh, the old conference. Um, well, I will I will discuss. I would like to present you some some aspect we have been working on on uh, on, on sustainable uh, ship design. Um, and um, and especially on, on, on certain factors that are uh, influencing it. Um, so, well, just to start up, what's in the title? Um, of course, we have sustainable. Sustainability, it's a, it's a very broad word to, to say a lot of things, um, but it's really the, the basis of, of this conference and also the basis of many new questions we receive and many questions that have at this moment ship designers, ship owners, uh, ship operators. Um, the idea basically is to, to try to do the same that we have done the last uh, thousand years, or let's say the last hundred years with uh, the help of fossil fuel, but this time without emission and in a sustainable way. So this is really, let's say, a different scene, a different goal as well. Uh, but the old, the old story here become, starts with a, a sustainable goal. Then what I would like to relate these sustainable goals and, and the way we design ships is to, to try to illustrate um, how the alternative power sources, so I don't say only energy, but power sources uh, are influencing uh, the new design and, and shipping operation. Then also how the infrastructures um, um, will um, help or slow down or influence mainly um, uh, this, this change to sustainable uh, designs and, and sustainable shipping. And last but not least, operation themselves um, also can contribute or not in, in making this uh, possible. You have seen in your uh, courses that I'm talking to the, the student on the web, but to all the uh, naval architects um, that have studied the, uh, the uh, let's say, very standard uh, design loop for uh, for ships. It's a well-known design spiral. Uh, we always have to take some into account with such a complex, uh, let's say, engineering, some steps um, and try to converge with uh, towards the final design and be able to build and operate a ship. Um, as you see here, let's say there are always some probably powering, but the definition of, of the powering comes usually quite quite late when, when you have to um, uh, to look at your your design. Um, it, it mainly comes from the fact that it it was what we have been using so far was extremely mature. So you know that you can always almost always fit an engine and fit enough energy carrier on a ship so that the powering aspect let's say, um, comes at, at the later stage. Um, also the arrangement, uh, hull, but especially machinery and engine room uh, are barely take all our first steps. So they are coming, like I said, as a consequence of the first choices and also the, um, uh, the estimate of the, uh, of, of the ship weight, for example. Um, last but not least, operations are not in that loop. And um, um, I hope that after this presentation, um, um, I will be able to convince you that, that those aspects about engine room, uh, definition of machinery, machinery uh, powering aspect, energy management aspects, uh, uh, weight estimate and operation should actually come uh, extremely, extremely soon in the, uh, in the concept of, uh, of ships. 
Let's start with the first topic, um, influence of alternative power sources. All the energy that we can create, all the, um, uh, all the power that we can uh, create, but basically energy, it's coming from, from Earth. Um, well, we do not have uh, uh, other ways to, let's say, create uh, certain energy carriers. Those one can have, let's say, different, uh, they can have different sources. So, well, we have been offered for many, many years and it helped the development of the industrial revolution, the use of uh, fossil type of energy uh, in the form of coal, crude oil, or natural gas. Um, we know that we also can create energy out of biomass uh, that can come from crops, from waste, and we can also create uh, energy from that. We can also create uh, energy from uh, metal. So that can be, let's say, burning powder of metals, but also using other type of metals to, to create nuclear energy. And we also have um, solar, wind, or hydrothermal uh, sources to create electricity, for example. But basically, all those uh, resources are available on Earth. And from these resources, um, we can create about an infinite combination of, of energy carrier. Uh, the, the most known diesel, let's say, uh, used in the form of marine gas oil MGO on, on ships, very complex uh, type of molecule uh, containing an awful amount of energy, uh, let's say, for a little volume and, and weight. Uh, we also have methane, uh, LPG, ethanol, uh, dimethyl ether, methanol, ammonia that can be created, well, let's say, processed basically from hydrogen, also other types of of, of hydrogen carriers, uh, metal powder, electricity. So all these energy carriers can be called uh, fuels uh, to relate to our earlier discussion, uh, um, uh, but they are basically facilitating uh, the storage of, of a certain quantity of, of energy. On the bottom line, uh, do not forget to put the winds, direct winds as also an energy carrier uh, to be able to, uh, to create power. Well, when we are, uh, uh, let's say, moving stuff around, it can be ships, planes, cars, trucks, um, we need to put this energy carrier and, 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 and into certain type of engine and, and the energy is converted to power um, and then distributed through different types of, um, of, of systems. Uh, it can be direct propulsion system through gearbox that can also be uh, hybrid propulsion system with gearbox, uh, let's say internal combustion engine gearbox, but also uh, electric motor or direct electric propulsion, uh, and of course self-assisted or uh, self full cell propulsion. Um, these are all ways uh, to go from a basic resources, um, uh, have energy, and then uh, propel our uh, uh, ships. Um, you can make many combinations, and actually the choice is very large today. Uh, this is just one example of a pathway, which is very much discussed on, on many projects, starting with uh, wind energy, uh, having electricity, then stored that into hydrogen. Hydrogen would go through fuel cells uh, to produce, again, electricity on board and, and drive an uh, electric propulsion system. What we have been doing the last years, and um, I presented that part so last year, so I'll not spend a lot of time, but we have been working out um, um, many combinations um, of those steps from resources to energy, energy conversion and, and distribution. And actually this uh, kind of spaghetti, I, I heard a few times when people call that a French spaghetti now, uh, but there has been just work out through one of our websites that we put available uh, as, as public data, just an example of many combination of how can you obtain, uh, let's say, power on board to, um, uh, to, to towards your um, uh, prime mover. Um, these are about 80 combinations, but there's surely 150, 200, 250. It's, it's, quite, it's quite large, the number of combinations you can do. Every system is using uh, energy with a certain efficiency. So there are losses in the old process. Um, and they also are responsible for a certain amount of emission uh, for every kilowatt hour that you're using. Um, this is the last part of this uh, figure showing that for any choice that you would make in a design, 
you end up or at 100%, so it's basically the same amount of emission uh, in terms of CO2 equivalent, global warming potential than using fossil based diesel, or you can go up to close to 0% if you're choosing a, a different pathway. So on paper, you could say that there are many solutions, technical solution with different degrees of maturity that can lead to a certain uh, energy delivered um, without emission, emission, and there are many who are doing barely better than uh, the current uh, uh, fossil-based uh, diesel. And there are many solutions in between. So technically speaking, you could say, well, the solutions are here. So let's just build the ship and design it as we have always done. And then, um, and then uh, well, problem is solved. Well, there are um, inherent differences in the energy carrier that are extremely, too, too, extremely important for uh, a ship designer. Um, uh, this has been already found out since long by the, the car industry. Um, um, but given the amount of energy needed for ships, amount of power to be delivered, um, uh, let's say the, the um, uh, ships, but also planes, for example, or trucks have to face uh, other type of problems, basically uh, related to uh, uh, volume, and weight of the uh, new energy carriers. On that, um, on that figure here, um, you see two things. You see on the horizontal scale, the contained gravimetric energy density. So it's the amount of energy, in that case in, in megajoule, that is contained with one kilogram of diesel, for example, or a DMA or methanol or other type of energy carrier. And on the vertical side, the energy, the volumetric energy density. Uh, so it's in megajoule per uh, liter or per volume. Um, one word is very important is contained because uh, it's not only about the molecules that you bring on board, it's also about the way they are stored on board. When you have um, uh, compressed hydrogen, for example, uh, you actually need to uh, count the uh, containment system, which is heavier uh, than the molecule themselves. Um, so what is important in, in the ship design process is to evaluate if you are going towards alternative energy carriers to evaluate what will be the additional weight or the additional volume required by the uh, alternative energy carriers. Um, I just put here for reference the same graph, but in a different way, just, uh, just to show how much weight um, uh, costs one kilowatt hour that you have to store on board. I put that in pounds, uh, that may be better for uh, uh, the current audience. Uh, but when you're going from diesel, which is, let's say, the winner at this moment um, uh, in terms of energy content, uh, you're going to methane, that's quite equivalent, then ethanol, dimethyl ether, methanol, ammonia, and liquefied uh, hydrogen that you see already going from. Uh, the step of, of diesel to an alternative liquefied uh, hydrogen or, um, uh, equipment on board, um, uh, then you will have to, let's say, arrange um, uh, space or wait for about three times uh, with a factor of three. Um, so this will, I think you understand it, that will have an impact, uh, a clear impact on, on your general arrangement and on the uh, room you have to leave for uh, the energy carriers. When looking at, looking at compressed hydrogen solutions, then uh, it takes even more space. And when you look at electricity, so battery, this is even more. So uh, basically, what we have to do with ships is not as easy as um, a fit battery pack in a car. I mean, cars have been doubling in, 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 in weight about going from diesel to, uh, to battery uh, times two to three. But for um, uh, systems that will have to deliver uh, a large amount of power, it's even more. In that case, it would be up to 100. So, um, well, there will be uh, typically um, a, a challenge to simply decide to change energy carrier and decide to put the same system on board. Um, in some cases, that will just be physically not, not possible. This is just to illustrate uh, uh, two engine room. Uh, that was just for a, a, a river ship, uh, the space um, uh, that is drawn for a, a, a standard dirty drive train. Uh, I think that case was with uh, a mix of battery and, 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 and methanol. And, and that was the same design uh, um, 
investigating the space needed by uh, a compressed hydrogen uh, system and, and battery. So it's easy to see that your choice of energy carrier um, uh, can influence directly your uh, uh, design, um, uh, especially the general arrangements and the, the space you need to uh, dedicate for the engine room and for the uh, uh, storage, uh, energy storage system. Um, this is again, the, the, let's say, the figure of all possibles. And when you want to do um, a work today on, on chip design, um, you first need to investigate the, um, the options you have on, on energy. Uh, this is an example of a study we've made for the uh, uh, for the uh, Dutch uh, Coast Guard. Uh, those are ships, um, uh, existing ships, and and we have been asked to to work out, uh, let's say, to look at different options for the ships to conduct the same type of operation, uh, keeping the same uh, main particulars, um, and looking at alternative to the uh, current uh, diesel installation. Um, well, there are many acronyms here, uh, but it stands for a uh, methanol solution or H2 hydrogen uh, or DME or liquefied uh, hydrogen. Uh, you see here that, uh, well, uh, this red line is the uh, total shield displacement. Um, so in that case, going from diesel to something else, well, you need to make more room uh, for the energy system and for the uh, uh, power system that goes with. And, and sometimes some options that can be on paper very good because they provide you a zero emission operation and you want to keep the same type of energy on board, the same type of autonomy, then you would go from, let's say about 10%, 5 to 10% of your ship displacement used for energy and power systems up to 60%. Where in that case, there will be little room left for uh, ribs, for cranes, for a wheelhouse and for all the other equipments. So basically, the first study of the options in terms of energy, energy containment, and, and, and power systems um, um, will give you, uh, let's say, the overview of, 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 of possible alternatives and just impossible uh, alternatives if you want to keep the same mission statements and the same, um, and, and the same uh, operations. Um, this is an overview of what needs to be set within your ships of the future. Um, this is all, let's say, an overview of, of a complete uh, power plant, uh, still with some generator, uh, super caps, battery sets, uh, a grid converter, hydrogen fuel cell. Um, but all these components uh, needs to be tackled very, very early in the design because inherently they will take more space and uh, in terms of volume and more weight than the traditional systems. And some solutions that will provide you the right solutions to be zero emission will just not be able to be fitted into your pool. Um, in that case, we need to adopt different types of methodology and we have been introducing uh, since three years, uh, model-based system engineering um, in, in, in chip design. We are trying to explore the possibilities and, and to show the uh, the end that it could bring. Um, and what is very interesting, if you're starting your ship design, not anymore on a traditional way on, on your ship, on your hull, and, and uh, allowing a certain percentage of your uh, volume and weight for the compartment, the uh, uh, energy storage, but you're starting from your power plant and define it uh, and model it uh, in terms of systems, then you will make sure uh, in that way that you will um, uh, just allow the implementation of the solutions and, um, and, and make sure that it will still function at the end. So that part was, let's say, for the influence of energy carriers um, uh, and alternative energy carriers, uh, let's say, in terms of fuel uh, on your design. But if you want to go a step further uh, in, in, in your sustainability, um, then there's a very simple principle. The most sustainable energy is the energy you don't use. And in that case, uh, wind uh, uh, is taking their uh, uh, really a growing uh, place. Uh, well, most of you may have seen this type of uh, figure uh, showing the, the, let's say, the, the old traject of, 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 of energy from wind, uh, wind turbines, grid electricity, then conversion to um, electrofuels going back to a, a combustion engine, getting lost uh, through the propeller, and finally uh, using basically 10% uh, of the original wind energy that could be effectively used for propulsion. 
when you have um, a wind propulsion on board, uh, it's a, a community that you cannot store. So you cannot also cannot predict uh, the amount that you will have for your full um, uh, project um, or your full crossing. But that will still remain the most efficient way to use the original uh, uh, energy. When you're introducing, then on top of alternative carriers, when you introduce wind propulsion, that will even have a larger impact on your, uh, on your uh, ship design. So we have at this moment retrofits, and uh, this is more in the category of uh, uh, light wind assistance. <laughs> so you could pick up 5 to 6%. Maybe up to 10% of the total record power. Um, uh, this can be seen as an energy efficiency uh, aspect, and the design of the ship will basically not really be changes. You can do some refit on existing vessels. You might have to look at your rudder area if uh, the, the installation of, of wind devices exceed three, four, five percent. But basically, this step will not have a, a drastic influence on your design. When you're going to, um, uh, uh, let's say, a larger 50-60% of your total energy that could originate from, um, uh, from wind, um, uh, then you really need to rethink or to adapt or modify your ship design. And up to the last step, if you're going up to, let's say, 60-65, up to 100% of uh, power coming from wind, then this is really a radically different type of whole form and, and appendages. Um, just to illustrate that, uh, your balance um, will be different. So you will need to work on your appendages. Uh, this is basically for refit where the hull will remain the same. So you can you can maybe add some deck board or uh, look for, uh, let's say, more powerful uh, lifting devices uh, on the rudder side. Um, um, Oh, sorry, I should have clicked there. So, well, basically, to counteract the, uh, the the largest part of the of the side force uh, due to wind propulsion system, then you will have to counteract this by additional appendages and mainly on on the on the aft part of the of the ship. Then, when you're looking at maneuvering as well, uh, course keeping and turning ability, then you will also need to add some lifting surface to accommodate for the additional uh, wind propulsion. This has been shown by. Uh, different studies that we have been uh, conducting. Um, and, and basically, if you grow in the amount of power that would be delivered by, uh, by sails and, and, and from wind, um, then you will have to even go to, let's say, change your whole dimensions, basically to have more uh, increased drafts, um, even uh, changing your, uh, your section shapes, uh, going much more to V-shapes, um, avoid uh, also wide flat transom, uh, enlarged kegs and build skills, maybe adding appendages like uh, larger kills or even daggerboard, um, and, and really improve on the F part, the, the lifting uh, coefficient of your, uh, of your rudders. Um, well, you never get something free uh, when you change the balance in a design. So what you will get as improvement and requirements to be able to accommodate for additional forces and side forces uh, from wind propulsion, you will have to pay back with a degradation of the performance when you're selling back on propeller uh, without wind assistance. So um, the difficulty will be finding the trade-off of, of the best solution that will accommodate the amount of time that you will be selling with wind assistance or wind propulsion and the amount of time that you will not sell um, uh, with the help of, uh, of wind. So, the only way to find a compromise will be to be able to simulate the operational profile and the way the ship will operate. Um, another point that is quite challenging as well um, is the propeller efficiency. Um, when you will have wind support, um, uh, then uh, well, there will clearly be an unloading of, on the propeller and the propeller will not run anymore in the most efficient way. So also on that part, um, we will have to rethink and rework on the way we optimize propellers. And again, the operational profile and the way the ship will be used will dictate the way you would like to, uh, let's say, to optimize your profile, to optimize your uh, uh, propeller, if you're still thinking of, of, of making operation hybrid. So still with the help of propeller and, and the support of, uh, of, uh, of wind. 
So this is for the, uh, let's say, the influence of the alternative power sources. Um, then in terms of infrastructures, um, uh, this is also going to influence largely, um, maybe not the, the way she operate, but the, the, type of, um, uh, the type of alternative solution that will um, uh, come on the market and come into operation. I show you here a totally different map. That's not a map of, of, of the sea, but it's a map of, of the US with the, let's say, the current uh, location of, of, uh, of superchargers uh, from a well-known brand. And um, uh, in that case of deployment, implementation of, of electric cars, and the same happened in Europe at this moment, uh, the success of introducing new type of, uh, let's say, alternative energy lays not only on the technology itself, which is used on the asset, on the car or on the, uh, uh, on the, uh, on, on the, on the ship, but also um, it depends a lot on how the infrastructure will adapt to uh, sustain the development and implementation of the alternative energy. We are working now at this moment at, um, uh, with studies on uh, partly to electrify or let's say to, yeah, to electrify, let's say to put electric um, engine on board um, a large quantity of, of inland uh, vessel. Uh, this map is the, um, let's say the map of, of Northern uh, Europe. And, and in blue, you have the, uh, what is called the, the Rhine corridor. So ensuring a lot of um, a volume of uh, goods being transported from Rotterdam uh, up, to, uh, up to Germany, uh, through uh, Netherlands, uh, Belgium, Luxembourg. Um, um, there's about 9,000 ships who are doing the, the work, who are sailing, uh, basically all with MGO. And we are doing studies on, on, uh, on um, let's say, looking at alternative electric propulsion for those ships or hydrogen based, but that will also be electric at the end, electric propulsion. Um, in any case, um, uh, the infrastructure will be the bottleneck because we can build today's ship with uh, let's say batteries on board in instead of of, um, of of a standard uh, internal combustion engine, but the weight of the battery is such that you are not able to uh, reach the same autonomy and have the same amount of uh, energy stored on board. Might be 10% of what we used to have with diesel. In that case, just like cars, you will need to recharge uh, to load your uh, your batteries or exchange batteries, but that will ask a lot on the infrastructures. And along the way uh, of the rivers, the, uh, uh, the current is not the same depending on the seasons. So there are some portion of the river. <laughs> well, you will have to use a lot of, actually a lot of energy uh, per mile and other portion that will, you will need less. Um, and then the old studies to, to look at the, let's say the operation of ships on those rivers, to look at the seasonal change depending on the current and the rate of the rivers um, and to define at which location um, we'll have to present uh, charging, let's say, charging locations for um, uh, those electric uh, inland ships. So this is, well, this is, let's say, um, uh, a simple example on, on how the infrastructures really need, uh, can influence uh, the adoption implementation of alternative energy and, and how it should be made hand in hand with the, uh, uh, with the users. Um, there are interesting codes that were made by uh, <laughs> Maersk uh, um, this year because they have really engaged now. It's I mean it's a small step. It's twelve vessels, but they want to go for a large amount of their fleets uh, toward uh, green methanol. Um, and the solutions to let's say sell a ship on methanol exist, but um, uh, the biggest challenge is to find partnership for Max to have this green methanol produced and deliver where the ships need it. Um, they have an interesting code here, um, and it's not about their largest challenge is not actually to design and build the ships based on green methanol, but the, the biggest, uh, the critical part uh, would be the availability of green methanol for the fleet transition. So you see here in that case as well, that was the same case with, uh, let's say, electric uh, inland ships um, uh, with charging batteries, but that will also be the case for uh, ocean going vessels. If you choose ammonia, if you choose uh, a green methanol or hydrogen, that will be just the availability in amount and at the right time, at the right spot of the new energy that you need. Um, we've come from, let's say, I think, um, I would not say that called that golden years, but 
Um, we, we never thought anymore, I think, in our designs about energy use and uh, energy availability. Many bill carriers, for example, are just getting their full tank of, um, of MGO in Singapore because of tax reason, because it's cheaper, but they're just going from Singapore all around the world back to Singapore just on the same tank. They do not fuel in between. So you could think afterward that's a bit insane to make a world trip with one tank full um, and you can go back to the same place. Um, so there's some room for improvement there. Um, um, and, and, and maybe the, the, the space dedicated for, um, for the fuels could be reduced or readapted. But if you think that you are going per definition to use energy carrier that take more weight and more space, then you will have to find another way to, uh, to bunker. And, and, and then infrastructure will be a very important part of this, uh, of this transition. Um, well, on the same line, uh, that was announced just Friday, so it's nice to see that it's moving on here. Um, uh, there's also, let's say, a change in the energy infrastructure in the policy. And, and when someone like Maersk is changing their or deciding to, to go for a certain development, that has quite a big impact. But Maersk is making at this moment agreement with different countries and different regions to ensure um, uh, their, uh, let's say, availability of, of, of their selected type of alternative energy carrier. And in that case, that was made uh, with Spain Friday uh, to make sure that their fleets uh, could, uh, let's say, could, could benefit from locally produced based on solar and wind, uh, hydrogen with carbon capture to create uh, a green methanol and available for their fleet. So you see that in two ways, the designs are changing, ship design are changing, but also the infrastructure, energy infrastructure needs to go hand in hand. Um, well, well, that brings me to a, a, another part. Um, uh, you see that along the routes where ships are sailing, um, you have different countries or archipelago or islands that are providing very high in saying, well, we can become the next producer or the next suppliers of uh, electrofuels for a shipping industry, which is uh, changing. And this is the case at this moment for Balear Islands, um, uh, trying to make use of their local resources, solar and wind, together with two regions in Spain to try to, uh, to be, let's say, the base for uh, providing uh, alternative um, uh, energy carriers. This map, um, well, I think it's just an illustration of how the world is today and, and, and let's say the amount of, uh, let's say the importance different countries have in the energy supply. Uh, well, the first one is where you are. United States, uh, followed by Russia, Iran, Canada, Qatar, China, Norway, Australia, Saudi Arabia, and Algeria. They are the 10, let's say, largest producer in that case of, of fossil fuel production. Of course, the fuels are not staying there for bunkering. They're also sent by tankers to uh, a refinery and then provided to ships. But this map is likely to change a lot in 2050 at the moment that uh, people will adopt, hopefully, alternative energy carrier based on uh, renewable energy because many countries, which at this moment do not have and never had the, let's say, the, the, the gift uh, um, to have uh, fossil uh, energy, uh, could become potentially uh, a producers and exporter of, of alternative sustainable uh, um, uh, energy. So the map in 2050 will likely be different. I don't know how exactly, uh, but if we follow a, a path to go for zero emission, hopefully it will be uh, uh, different than that one. Last but not least, influence of operations. Um, and this is where everything should start with the new designs. Um, the way you conduct operation uh, for a ship drives the amount of energy that you will need. So any project that we are running now, even talking about uh, main particulars, about displacement, about payload, we are looking at, um, uh, let's say, the, uh, the, the power time uh, chart and also the energy time chart. And we are looking at how much power needs to be delivered during given operations um, and for which duration. So if you are, um, and this is an example of, Oh, sorry, a fast intervention vessel, a light ship, 
that's doing quite some patrol at, um, at, at low power. So you see in the graph, something like 10% of the total power is used most of the time. And then from time to time, you need to do fast intervention at sea. And, and, and suddenly you go from zero to 100% power use and for short duration. So the study and, um, and, 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 and the understanding on how the power is distributed over time and how much energy is needed to cover the autonomy um, gives you the, um, let's say, the, the uh, constraints and the envelope of, 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 of the solutions that you uh, might be able to, uh, to choose. In that case, that was quite extreme. You have a maximum ship displacement of 50 tons. Uh, you have on the left-hand side, the, uh, let's say, the, uh, the weight uh, in metric ton of the uh, diesel installation. And we have just been working out uh, a solutions that technically provide the right power and power time chart. But then you end up with solutions like, uh, well, most of them on the right-hand side, um, the amount of weight that you would need to install on board is, is even factor two more than the displacement of the ship itself. So there are basically impossible solutions, but these are the only solution and their dimensioning that would provide the right, uh, the right power at the right moment. We are busy also, another example of how the operation are driving the design. Uh, we are working now on, uh, on a replacement for um, a multipurpose vessel, also of the uh, Dutch Coast Guards. Um, here, the scope of work is, is reduced because we are only looking at two alternatives uh, with a green methanol and with uh, hydrogen. Um, but we are also starting with, let's say, uh, the type of mission and the event, uh, the power time charts. And then um, those aspects on the operations are defining the requirements for the uh, power system on board. And those are defining the amount of um, weight and volume you need to carry to be able to conduct your operation with sustainable uh, alternative uh, energy carriers. In that case, also starting always with the power time chart. Um, 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 we have ships that are anchoring quite a lot of time. They're also selling, they're doing hydrographic survey. And, and the new type of energy you put on board, we didn't we never had to think about when using diesel and internal combustion engine. They were always fitting in the engine room that was already known. But now we really need to um, uh, rethink the way the ships are uh, designed and the general arrangement. These are all the solutions, uh, a baseline diesel solution. Then we are looking at methanol solutions. Um, well, more energy density than uh, diesel, but still likely fitting, and then hydrogen solutions, which are much more, um, let's say, challenging because uh, the required volume and weight is it's much more than the uh, original uh, diesel. When looking at that, um, we need to look at alternative designs, playing on displacement length beam draft, uh, to make sure that the solution would fit um, in the new design. And then looking at alternative, rethinking the way we want to adapt the length, um, a length on water line, the beam, displacement. Um, uh, so usually we try geometrically to fit the alternative carriers and the alternative power uh, systems. But if it doesn't work, you have to go further and rethink your operations. That's the case, for example, on uh, river to come back on that example. Um, we are looking at ways to modify the operations, uh, slowing, uh, slowing down the, steep, the, the speed even further to be able to introduce um, alternative uh, carriers. That has been the case as well for um, uh, wind propulsion. These were two studies that we have uh, done uh, last year. On the left hand side, looking at a conventional diesel powered uh, Atlantic crossing between France and US <coughs> um, with a standard, let's say, service speed of 50 knots, allowing for rerouting as well to avoid bad weather. Um, and then we have been looking at alternative uh, service, but in order to introduce uh, wind power and to minimize the amount of battery that would be needed on board, then the speed was reduced to 11 knot service speeds, including rerouting. And that was the only way, reducing energy use, and that was the only way to uh, introduce uh, a new type of, uh, uh, of solutions. Well, doing that, you can reach for the same amount of payload transported, but then over a longer a period of time, up to 75 reduction in energy use, uh, which would be also equivalent in terms of, uh, of emission. Well, we talked about demonstrator. 
um, going for different types of operation. On the left-hand side, you have the, uh, the canopy development. Uh, top left, it's a, uh, let's say a, a digital picture, but hopefully uh, a bottom left, that is the, uh, the whole that has been built, delivered, and the outfitting is currently uh, working. So that will be basically the first ship, let's say with a significant amount of, 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 of wind powered, that will do constant crossing through Atlantic uh, up to Guyane. And uh, that hopefully will open the route to other designs like the, the one on, on, the, on the top uh, right from Nail Lines, or from the new um, uh, upcoming design for container transport from uh, Zephyr and Boré. And in, in that case, um, uh, the way ships are built are evolving. The design of the hull is changing. Uh, the appendages are getting bigger, even decker boards, uh, a different type of uh, old hull and different types of operations uh, as well. So just to uh, uh, finish, um, I didn't get any sign that it was too long, so I'm just keep on talking, but I think you would like to take some questions as well. Um, uh, I'm putting the, uh, the conclusions now. Um, zero emission or carbon neutral waterborne activities are possible technically, but new ship designs need to integrate following changes. And that's very important, especially for the, let's say the new generation of, of ship designers coming. Put sustainable performance first and start the design loop from an energy and, and energy power management perspective. So knowing how much power you use, when, for which duration, and how much energy is needed, and reduce the energy would be the key factor defining your, uh, let's say, your design constraints and, and driving your solutions and, and, and helping you obtaining the most optimum design. And the second one, um, try to look at your ship as a system, and especially the power plant and the energy management of your ship. Um, um, it's hardly possible today and, and usually brings to, let's say, issues during the building. Don't think that just adding system afterwards will make the job. It's extremely complex to, um, uh, to modify a power plant with alternative energy, especially electric systems, too late. Every system will need some cooling. Um, uh, there are many systems you should never forget when you're going to alternative uh, uh, energy source. Um, so the only way you will be able to build Tesla of the sea is really starting through the energy uh, infrastructure, the power management system, and then build your ship around. This is really asking for a different approach for ship design, but it's really worth it because that will really ensure that all the systems can at least be integrated uh, on board. Um, displacement payload likely to be adapted as well. Um, uh, because if we remain with the same wish in terms of payloads, same wish in terms of, um, uh, let's say, operational speed uh, displacement, it will be very, very hard to, um, uh, to open the door to alternative uh, energy carriers. So in that case, designers and shipyards also need to discuss very early at the concept with the operators and, and sometimes arbor authorities uh, to make sure that they can just free some constraints and then um, is the, uh, the introduction of, of, uh, of alternative designs. Reducing drastically energy use, um, uh, that's almost compulsory. Um, we will not be able to put the same amount of energy that we used to put on, your, on our ships. So we need to reduce drastically this and hopefully, that yeah, obviously uh, use of wind or solar as free but non-storable energy source uh, needs to be done in, in any case. Of course, it will depend on the operations. Not every ship could equally profit from wind propulsion, but it's almost an, a no-brainer option that must come in any new design. And then maybe by changing operation, if it can really boost the use of, of wind energy, then it, it should be discussed with the uh, uh, people in charge of the operations. Um, well, that's already said then in case um, the main performance, the, let's say the performance depends mainly on, on wind as primary source. Then obviously uh, from the start, the whole design will be different, the appendages as well, but also the operational profile and, uh, and logistics. Um, work hand in hand with infrastructure and energy sector. This is what MERS is doing. It's not only about um, owning and, and providing, uh, owning a ship and providing let's say, um, uh, um, uh, let's say design um, uh, and, and, and mission statement for the ship, but it's also discussing with the infrastructure and, and talking to the energy sector to make sure that the operation will be able to run. 
And last but not least, open your mindset to unusual uh, performance and unusual environmental performance instead of trying to optimize business as usual. I think this is very important, staying on business as usual and trying to keeping on reducing uh, the resistance and try to keep on, uh, let's say, polishing the stone will never allow to go to zero emission. There will be a transition to even more energy efficiency, but going to zero emission really has to think out of the box. So be open for unusual business. Um, that will help you hopefully designing the ships of the future. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, I'd like to open the floor to questions. There are three questions that have come in online during the course of this. So I just wanted to get to those first and then any other questions that we have from the audience or elsewhere, I'll be more than happy uh, to, to help uh, relate to, uh, to Gilham. Uh, first, and the first one from uh, Peter Brin, it's more of a, I guess it's more of a comment than a question. I was saying that batteries probably aren't an option for most ocean going vessel power. Uh, just in your graph, he was recommending maybe showing energy density adjusted for efficiency. Uh, otherwise, it may be a little misleading. And just, did you have any uh, any any comment on that? I, I, I fully agree with it. Eh? And, um, and and the graph was only intended as introduction to show the uh, the energy density because the, the the weight of the batteries will be too far. We we see already that we have problems, and it's simply impossible to put the same amount of energy on the uh, same amount of energy on the, let's say on, on river ships or fast displacement vessel. Um, so despite the additional efficiency of battery, the amount of energy that will also define your maximum autonomy will not, uh, it will just be impossible to carry it on board. So uh, for ocean, uh, ocean going vessel batteries is definitely not an option. I fully agree with that. Okay, great. Uh, second question came from George. I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing your, your last name correctly. Uh, Jagit, uh, thanks Gilham for the very extensive presentation. What do you think about using nuclear power for merchant vessels? Would this be an option to provide energy for the areas where the wind is not present? And then he has a second question uh, regarding electric propulsion to avoid long charging hours and draining the electricity grid from inland ports located nearby cities. Would it be possible to equip ships with an exchangeable battery that are to be charged during off-peak, i.e., a battery swap approach? Well, thank you for this uh, for, this, for those two questions. Very relevant. Um, uh, we see more and more projects starting with indeed um, uh, concept of, of, of nuclear plants on board. Well, I I, I mean it's um, it exists already. Uh, many icebreakers, uh, well, many from the Russian fleets are are selling on uh, on, on nuclear power. Also, uh, several navy ships. So technically speaking, that that's of course possible to uh, uh, to sell, um, uh, uh, let's say, a large container vessel or a, a large vessel, cargo vessel with nuclear plant. Um, well, the debate will much more be, I think, on on the on the. There's even projection that the cost might. I mean, you could have a return on investment on, on the lifetime of a ship. Um, uh, but I think that the the where the, the question will raise is not really on the on the. Well, of course, on the technical part, because you will need to have a crew which are different type of capacity than now, and, and you require a lot of, of specialized work on board to be able to run a nuclear plant. Um, uh, but there also will be question of security. I mean, any ship sailing with nuclear plant uh, at this moment is not sailing alone. There's always a bunch of ships around uh, uh, who are ensuring the security of those ships. And I don't know if we'll be able to uh, to provide that to any cargo vessel selling around. So um, there will also be clearly some geopolitics or safety aspect that will go much further than only technical uh, aspect of it. So technically possible, but I'm not. I'm. I'm. We'll see. I mean, this is an interesting discussion, um, and it will be nice to to discuss with people who are pro, try to reduce that, and people who think that will not be realistic for uh, other aspect or other arguments than only technical. Um, the second question was on the, on the battery. <clears throat> There's actually in the in Netherlands um, uh, a pilot study to, uh, um, I mean, at, at the moment, um, a river ship will go to, um, uh, to battery electric, so uh, to ensure maximum efficiency directly, uh, battery electric drive propulsion. Um, then the autonomy will be reduced compared to now uh, by a factor of 15 to 20. So that means that along your route, you will have to turn 20 times. 
um, charging times would become, in that case, a very large part of the operation, uh, which is not wishful. So there are the pilot projects to have, let's say, the battery installed on containers. And uh, instead of charging the containers with battery, uh, there will be a swap of battery uh, at different harbors. And um, if you can realize this operation quite quickly, then it will just be a question, or you do that in lock, for example, and then you could just swap battery and, and give back your, um, uh, well, your, um, uh, your, your old battery or your uh, battery and then just take a full one. Um, I've seen recently this is also proposed for um, in, in the car industry to have a, a swapping battery uh, aspect instead of, of charging. Um, so that, that could be a possibility, of course. Uh, for, uh, okay, uh, great, thank you. Uh, another comment that came in during the presentation, uh, again from Peter Bryn, uh, the cost of producing truly zero emission methanol is dramatically more than the green ammonia and likely always be. Uh, the primary challenge is capturing the carbon atom needed for its production. Uh, early moves into methanol are largely because it's available more today more readily. Uh, it's more of a drop in fuel and is less toxic. But it, what he commented on is that please recognize this is a bridge only. Uh, truly green methanol will be far more expensive than green ammonia. Uh, did you want to comment on that? Um, well, I, I'm not a specialist on all the topics, but I can comment a little bit uh, on that. Maybe while well, that's that's true at this moment, the, let's say that the calculation for costs are going towards ammonia. Um, uh, let's say a clear advantage compared to, and it's good to talk about truly zero emission methanol because if you wanted to make it truly, I mean, actually, it's not truly em zero emission methanol. It's truly um, uh, uh, carbon neutral methanol because you you pick up carbon from the atmosphere to create uh, uh, methanol and combine carbon with uh, renewable hydrogen, but then you release it back when you're uh, burning it. Uh, so that would be a carbon neutral. Uh, ammonia doesn't have uh, uh, carbon content, um, but that's all other, uh, let's say, uh, nasty drawbacks. And, and one of them is also uh, safety. Um, so again, that will not be about, um, I think if we only think that the introduction of, of alternative energy will go to the cheapest fuel, I know it's reality now, and I, I, I realize the constraints of, I mean, people need to go for the cheapest solution. Um, um, but I think that um, there might also be other consideration because there are now discussions about, uh, for example, in Rotterdam, making some uh, uh, scenarios about possible accident with uh, uh, ships filled with ammonia and going into harbors, which are located close to city. And uh, I mean, the possible risks are not trivial. Um, so there are many, many aspects playing. And, and I think that cost, of course, will be one of them. Um, but on the other hand, I mean, I don't have the answer there, but I think it's not only about cost. I agree about the, the remark, um, uh, but it's, it's a very complex uh, transition to use. So in, in any way, I think the only um, item when there's no discussion is that if we can use less energy and putting wind uh, uh, in the loop, uh, that will help any other energy carriers. And which energy carrier will be the most suitable? Well, that's, that's the debate is not yet. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, questions from the audience? Aiden. Uh, so you mentioned um, that ships will often go to like specifically Singapore for fuel because it's cheaper. Is there, um, or what kind of work is currently being done to make the, the current fuel infrastructure more efficient so that ships don't have to take roundabout or inefficient uh, strategies just to save money? Um. Well, actually, um, actually, the remark on Singapore is, is they're, they're not going uh, around. I mean, they're also delivering a lot of cargoes and containers in Singapore, but they are bunkering there. And, and, and um, so they are conducting operation also there. The, the fact that it's cheap makes them, let's say, refuel and all bunker to make sure that they can come back to the location with the same tank. Uh, but if you go to an energy carrier, which is five times less uh, dense in, in energy, you will have to, to, to bunker five times along the route. Um, um, so, I mean, at this moment, there are, I mean, there are some discussion between large harbors um, uh, worldwide uh, who provide supply energy, Rotterdam, Singapore, Shanghai, uh, uh, probably the same case with the US, um, but likely when introducing alternative energy, 
um, at that scale. And I think the same will happen likely with planes. Uh, there will need to be some, uh, I think, some agreement or some 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 uh, collaboration between different countries because um, uh, planes, ships are the only assets on Earth that are just going from one country to the other. So if you provide a new infrastructure for energy, it will have somehow to be done in a, in a, uh, with some kind of of cooperation between all the stakeholders. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> yep. Um, what other alternative energy storage devices have they considered besides batteries? Yeah. Oh, sorry, the mic was a bit, maybe a bit too far, but I didn't hear your question. The question was, what other uh, alternative energy uh, storage sources have been considered besides batteries? <laughs> Um, well, storage. Any any molecule is 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 has a storage capacity. I mean, for electricity, uh, uh, hydrogen is 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 uh, is electric storage as well. I mean, from hydrogen, you can just go with pilot fuel, and you can you can burn it uh, as well in 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 combustion engine. But when the hydrogen is used in a in a fuel cell, it's just released back uh, electron. So hydrogen or um, even methanol using a fuel cell or other energy carriers can also be seen as, um, uh, let's say, uh, a storage, electricity, uh, uh, a storage just like battery, but the weight of the system is less than batteries. So um, there are many ways to store electricity actually, yeah? but the, 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 old, the old choice will come from the constraints and the weight and the volume that you have to, uh, uh, to, to, to get on board and also, the amount of the energy that will define your autonomy. <clears throat> I, I don't know if it answered your question or. Yeah, thank you. Yes, question. Yes, um, my name is George Smith from um, the HLI. And I'm uh, hoping you hear me. Uh, I wanted to actually take it back as well on the battery part. But for that, I wanted to actually um, say a statement regarding what you said earlier in the discussion. Uh, regarding uh, new technology, identifying exactly um, companies that are trailblazing actual new technology that can use future application and identifying this. Uh, I'm, I'm working on a real estate application. I can't really discuss everything here, but what I can say is the stuff that is driving us now from our previous design that our mission requirements are going to kind of drive us outside of our norm. Kind of right now is you know our legacy um, technology and we're we're looking at future technology of course technology is not developed as yet but um, what we're trying to do is we're looking at the companies that are related to trailers but um, I, I do appreciate stating this feelings about that so I think I also wanted to kind of get back on the battery question um and I'm not sure you know your expertise in this but um, certain applications we're trying to kind of find a story as well as um, anti energy source. And I know right now, currently, there is, uh, we come down to solid state batteries, but when we come down to large applications, that's not, uh, the technology is not there yet. But if you think of the new or any um, information regarding solid state batteries and their applications come down to uh, maritime applications or anything like large scale. Um, Look, I'm not sure if you heard the whole question, uh, but the, uh, the 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 gist of it was: uh, uh, What information do you have on solid state batteries the, the, and the, the the current developments with those? Um, well, I just know that solid state batteries are very promising because you could improve drastically the the energy density. So that that would, I mean, at, at the moment, let's say in terms of efficiency. Uh, um, uh, Electric storage through battery is, is the most efficient if you look at just the losses in the old process. Uh, um, what makes it difficult to use for with large amount of energy and, and, and large power is just the weight, uh, the total weight and volume of the system. So um, any development that will reduce that or let's say improve the energy density will be beneficial. But uh, I'm a little bit afraid that, that if this is found that will first go to the automotive industry uh, very quickly and then aviation. And shipping might might be the last to be served. Um, uh, I'm afraid. Um, but current development, I know that many prototypes are being done, but I, I don't. We don't see yet. I mean, of, I've never. I didn't hear yet about 
uh, uh, let's say actual solid state batteries that are uh, um, uh, can be installed at this moment uh, on the market but um, i'm i'm myself not a specialist in 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 this so i'm, I'm not sure but I, I don't think there's any let's say industrial um, a product at this moment uh, that can be installed 